canapé. If you've been following science and specifically space related news in the past decade, you might have heard things like black holes or neutron stars or LIGO, and gravitational waves, and dark matter. If you're lost, it's okay. I'm also lost. But to understand it, uh, I think we should go back to the basics. Back when things were simple. Just close your eyes, think of a memory when you were on a road trip, maybe heading towards the woods or the seaside, maybe even the desert, somewhere far away from the city and its lights. You look up in awe as you gaze at the stars. But for thousands of years, humans have used their eyes to look up into the night sky and observe the lights coming from the stars. Astronomy back then has helped our ancestors navigate through waters and deserts, or even helped them to create calendars to determine, for example, harvest season. Technological advancements in astronomical equipment, namely the telescope, opened a new horizon for us to discover. From Galileo to the James Webb Space Telescope, many discoveries were made. The proof of the heliocentric model by Copernicus, the proof of the existence of black holes theorized by Albert Einstein, and even the adoption of the Big Bang theorized by Georges Lemaitre here in Leuven. However, there's one small problem. All of these observations were made by telescopes, telescopes that need light. Now, the more we understood through electromagnetic astronomy, the more we realized that most of the universe doesn't emit light. So even if we trace the movement of things that emit light, we realize there's so much more that doesn't emit light. Take this video of stars in the middle of the Milky Way as an example. These stars that you can see that are speeding up, they indicate that there's something invisible, but something massive, and it has a strong gravitational pull. We don't see it, but it's an indirect observation of a black hole. Now, black holes don't emit light, so we're not able to see them. But scientists are stubborn people, and surely, surely there's another way of detecting them. <laughs> the end. <laughs> In 1905, Einstein released his paper titled On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies, which established the foundations of special relativity, which simply says that space and time shouldn't be treated as two separate entities, but instead should be one, space-time. In 1915, Einstein announced the release of Relativity 2.0, the General Relativity Edition. In it, some patches were made to fix some bugs, and weird features were added, such as the bending of space-time, represented by these pictures that you can see every so often. Space-time is something that is not just this uh, rigid object or rigid thing, it's something that is dynamical. It can change, it can be curved, uh, depending on what's in it. Quickly afterwards, uh, he also realized that in principle, if you don't just have masses that are just sitting around doing nothing, and they're moving around, and these masses you know, are moving around each other, then what you're going to create, very much like in a body of water when you move around things, uh, you're gonna create waves. And so where we are standing right now in this transition between electromagnetic astronomy and gravitational wave astronomy is that for gravitational waves, anything that moves will emit gravitational waves, even things that don't emit light. What we're able to see with our conventional telescopes are things that emit light, pretty obviously, right? We're, we're able to see stars that emit light, we're able to see matter, dust that emits light. What we're now able to see with gravitational waves is a whole new corner of the universe, a whole dark corner of the universe, which we just weren't able to see before. And so the transition is from seeing only 5% of the entire universe, hopefully soon have the ability to see the remaining 95% of the universe. Okay, so two black holes 1.3 billion light years away violently collide and as a result send out gravitational waves. These gravitational waves travel to the universe and pass through Earth, stretching and contracting space while doing so. But how do we even measure that? Well, the team at LIGO had the solution. Build two long arms perpendicular to each other, put reflective mirrors at the end of them, and send in a laser beam which will be split and reflected back to the detector screen. Now because the length of these arms are equal, nothing happens to the laser and they will be in sync. But if gravitational waves pass by, then the length of the arms will change, causing the light to flicker and detection will be possible. And we're talking about lengths that are incredibly small. The change in length due to the gravitational wave passing by is something on the order of magnitude of less than a nucleus. That's correct. We were able to build a machine that is able to determine changes in length that are 10,000 times smaller than a proton. This is a great engineering feat. And then we look at ourselves in the mirror and we say, 
We can do better. We're going now in a planning phase for the third generation detectors. And so this is the Einstein telescope in Europe and the so-called Cosmic Explorer in the US. The ultimate goal is very similar, and that is to reach 10 times better sensitivity than the previous generation detectors. So to get these higher sensitivities, the Einstein telescope is going to be bigger. For scale, LIGO's arms are 4 kilometers. The Einstein telescope's arms will be 10 kilometers. Additionally, the Einstein telescope will be built 250 meters underground. You want to measure this change of length very, very precisely. But of course, there's a lot of different things that can influence your measurement. One thing that of course happens above ground is there's things like trucks and people and, and all kinds of things going around. And so to get away from all of these vibrations and the noise that it causes, we want to put Einstein telescope 200 meters underground to isolate it from all of this noise and to make, uh, make these precise measurements more possible. So with this precision, what type of insights can we get from the Einstein telescope? There's a bunch of things that we expect to see with Einstein telescopes. So the first thing is that because we're able to see much further away, we're going to be able to see a lot more gravitational wave events. And so this is going to tell us something about, you know, how many black holes are there in the gal in galaxies in the universe? It's going to tell us something about the population of stars and the evolution of stars because we know if we know that there's so many black holes then we know that before that they need to have been so many stars before that for example supernova uh, a supernova is a giant explosion which we can already see with our normal optical telescopes because it produces a lot of light but we also expect to see some gravitational wave signal coming from these supernovae that would of course tell us a lot more about what's going on in the supernova because there's a lot of uh, a lot of things about supernovae that we still don't really understand, right? We still don't really have a, a good understanding of what actually happens in such a supernova explosion. I can say that there's so much out there in the universe that doesn't admit light and that we don't understand, right? Two of which, we just lumped them together. We either say dark energy, which is, you know, the majority of the entire universe. That's the thing that makes universe, you know, expand. We don't know what that is. Dark matter which is still, you know, 25% of the entire universe. Or we think there's 25% of the universe. We don't know what that is. So I actually hope, but it's more of a hope than expect, that, you know, with the Einstein telescope, we can learn a little bit more about the dark side of the universe, which, as I said before, is about 95% of the entire universe. Of course, building the telescope underground is a huge undertaking, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. There are a lot of challenges, like how do you transport the equipment underground? What do you even do with that dirt that you collected? Scientists working on the project want the facility to be operative for 50 years. How do you maintain such a structure for a long time? And how do you do it sustainably? The project involves multiple organizations and countries. How do you manage this collaboration effectively? There are multiple research groups working in Maastricht as a part of the ET Pathfinder project to study and find solutions for these challenges. And maybe aspiring scientists and policymakers like you can help. One day, we will overcome these challenges. But there is an interesting point to reflect upon. Is this all really about gravitational waves? I mean, yes, of course, it's a gravitational wave detector, but maybe I mean... And the question arises, why put 2 billion euros in curiosity-driven science? We just concluded a study with an external partner to check what would be the relevance of a visitor center for the Einstein telescope. We asked it in turn that external partner to check this question with uh, the general public, with companies and with schools. So three different categories. And we got extremely positive feedback from each of those three categories. Based on what I said before, that we see this keen interest from uh, the public, we really hope that it will encourage young people to choose for science, technology, engineering, mathematics in their education. Anything that pushes our boundaries will have you know, benefits or even sometimes unplanned benefits. It would have a very big impact on the um, ecosystem of high-tech companies in the neighborhood of the place where we would build the Einstein telescope. When you're asking these most extreme questions and trying to do this most extreme science, 
we need to start building these kind of extreme infrastructures and it really just helps us to push the boundaries in terms of technology, in terms of electronics, in terms of vacuum. There is a kind of a guarantee that we will need state-of-the-art technology for the decades to come so there will be a kind of a continuous movement of companies developing state-of-the-art technology which then according to first studies also has the potential to be transferred to other sectors. But also it kind of stretches our boundaries in terms of collaborating with each other. Right? We're now entering a realm where no single university, single scientist, even a single country can do. So kind of really going on these large scale endeavors also pushes us to collaborate and really focus our energy and time in, in doing something good for humankind as opposed to well, other destructive.